Welcome everyone. I'm Clark and I'm the producer of this channel. I'm from Lehigh, Utah. I started Study My Gospel to provide another resource of online gospel learning. I partner with professional gospel instructors for our various series, including Come Follow Me, Gospel Topics, and more to come. If you like the content, please subscribe. Enjoy the video. Today, we're going to be talking about Mosiah chapter 7 through 10. As we talk about these chapters, it would be good to get an overview of some of the significant journeys that are going to happen in the Book of Mormon. Let me suggest two ways to do that. First, Brigham Young University has created an, an app called the virtualscriptures.org. And in that app, there's three parts. The first part is the virtual New Testament. It is a great app. In the virtual New Testament, you can look at places in, the, in Jerusalem, maybe where the Savior's been, where he's taught some events that are happening. You can go down and zoom in. You can see a short summary, scripture reference, take a 3D look at where you are, and just better understand Jerusalem at the time of Christ. It will enhance your understanding of events that happen during the life of Jesus Christ. The second part of virtualscriptures.org is a Book of Mormon map. And in the map, it really is designed to help you better understand the journeys of people as they go from location to location in the Book of Mormon. The third part is exploring an artistic uh, walkthrough of Mormon's cave on your computer. Kind of fun, but we're going to focus on the Book of Mormon map. Now, the Book of Mormon map right up front does not purport to be the unofficial map of events and locations in the Book of Mormon. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does not officially endorse any one particular geographical model for where the events of the Book of Mormon transpired in the New World. For that reason, we have designed and prepared this artistic rendering in such a way that you can get a basic idea of approximate directions and theoretical relationships between various geographical features mentioned in the stories. And I add a note that the Church has tried to do that as they produced the new videos in the Book of Mormon. I've had conversations with the producer of the book of these uh, videos. Wonderful man. And in, in our conversations, he talked about how great strides they took as a production and in their planning to make sure that what they produced for these videos was uh, gender, I mean, site nonspecific. You can't point to what they're doing and saying, oh, that's where it is. It's in Guatemala. Oh, this is where they're filming. This is where it should be. Some of their filming is done on different locations on purpose to make sure that it, you can't say the church is, su is supporting one theory or another. So, good to know. So, back to uh, the virtual scriptures. In it, you'll find some great resources to show you where these cities are in relation to each other. You'll see also like the land of Zarahemla. It's great to be able to see and map out some of these journeys and maybe kind of see where they're going by and what they're doing. A second way to do it is, now this is from that curriculum that the church has produced, is just a simple little map to say, here is how or the uh, journeys went with these significant ones in the book of Mosiah. So when I teach it, I just go through and give an overview before we do anything with these journeys. So like the first journey, you'll see uh, number one from the city of Zarahemla to the city of Lehi Nephi is an ill-fated journey. The second one, Zenith is going to come down and he's going to have make his way down to the land of the Lehi Nephi. Now number three is part of these people of Zenith who get a little curious and 43 of them go up and they try and find the city of Zarahemla. They come up, find some ruins, they think it's destroyed, not very happy. They do take a bunch of plates back to them that we'll come and talk about a little bit later. Now number four, we stay with this people of the city of, of the city of Lehi Nephi and Zenith, and they have King Noah, and then King Noah allows people to do some wicked things, and Alma escapes to the city or to the waters of Mormon. Number five 
is Ammon with a little bit of trying expedition to find Zenith. He's going to find Zenith in Mosiah chapter 7. And number 6, you have a people who now leave uh, the city of Lehi, Nehi, Nephi and go up to Zarahemla. And then number 7, we can't leave this group of Alma and his people there. They escape and get up to the city of Zarahemla. This type of an overview, and maybe reading a few verses, will take a few minutes, but it helps particularly our, our children have a better understanding of all these journeyings. Without it, they tend to become a little confused with all of that. Ammon, in chapter 7, verse 3, at the beginning of our reading this week, is described as a strong and a mighty man. King Limhi is a grandson. Limhi is the son of Noah, who is the son of Zenith. He's made king by the voice of the people. He has some great insights. One of the ones I just love is he talks about an if-then proposition here. If my people sow filthiness. I think we can generalize that for everybody. If we sow filthiness, we will reap something very specific. For Limhi, he says, then we will reap the chaff thereof in the whirlwind. And whirlwinds, you've probably been around these little dusters. They can become very, very strong. And you can tell that there's a lot of debris in it. It stings. You will get that in your life. You'll reap the east wind. Now, east wind is very symbolic. To the Semites, the west wind brought rain, and the east wind brought drought, which meant starvation and death. So if you're going to reap the east wind, you're going to reap starvation and death. It's a bad thing. But also, if you will turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart, put your trust in Him, serve Him with all diligence of mind, then God will deliver you out of bondage. This, we're picking up the same theme that Nephi introduces in the first chapter of the book of Nephi. Going back, remember, he said this, And when the Jews heard these things, they were angry with him, this is Father Lehi, yea, even as the prophets of old, uh, whom they had cast out and stoned and slain. And they also sought his life, that they might take it away. But behold, I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith, to make them mighty unto the power of deliverance. For Nephi and the people still in the Book of Mormon, it's very simple. You do what you should be doing. You put your faith in God, and he has the mighty power to deliver you to deliver you physically, in their case, spiritually, emotionally, to be able to bring you back and to restore you into his fold, to give you peace in whatever events are happening in your life. You can know of God's love today in your life. Now, there are also mention of several different types of plates. You get the plates of Limhi's people and the plates of the Jaredites in chapter 8. And the large plates of Nephi were kept by Mosiah and Zarahemla. They're different than these plates. Limhi's plates contain the record of his people from the days of King Zenith to his day. This is a record from which Mormon will take his abridgment comprising chapters 9 through 22. We must remember that there are many sets of plates other than the large and small plates of Nephi. In Mosiah 8, we learn the plates of Limhi's people, starting verse 5, and the 24 gold plates of the Jaredites, verse 9, are different. Now, the 24 gold plates, they have it in a language that they don't understand. And they look around and say, okay, who can understand them? Who can translate them? And there's a conversation about a seer. A seer is one who sees with spiritual eyes. He perceives the meaning of that which seems to obscure to others. Therefore, he is an interpreter and clarifier of eternal truth. He foresees the future from the past and the present. This he does by the power of the Lord operating through him directly or indirectly with the aid of divine instruments such as the Urim and Thummim. In short, he is one who sees, who walks in the Lord's light with open eyes. Now, Elder Witzel gave a great summary of what a prophet, a seer, and a revelator are. He said, a prophet is a teacher of known truth. A seer is a perceiver of hidden truth. A revelator is a bearer of new truth. In the widest sense, 
The one most commonly used, the title prophet, includes the other titles and makes the prophet a teacher, perceiver, and bearer of truth. Aren't you glad that we have a prophet? That we have 15 who we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators, who can discern truths, who can see things that sometimes we cannot see. As Elder Anderson testified, these 15 men we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators are given divine powers to see what others sometimes do not see. And I know that's true. They do. In these chapters, it's also good to make a comparison between two different types of people, their preparation, and what they don't do or do that helps the end. So, let me explain. Zenith and his people are a group of people, and the Lamanites are another. Each are going to prepare. One will put their trust in the Lord. One will not. They will have very different results. So, for Zenith and his people... And, and just as you teach this, it may be good to say, okay, let's search for these. Here's a little, I don't want to say a worksheet, but let's search and have you discover what the difference is in their preparation and in their putting the trust in the Lord and how the outcome is different. So you start looking at Zenith and his people. They arm themselves and they go to battle. Now, Lamanites here, they arm themselves and go to battle too. Zenith not only arms themselves, but remembers that to put their trust in the Lord. They pray. They remember the Lord has delivered their ancestors. They trust in the power of his might to be able to deliver them. The Lamanites, they do nothing. They rely on their own strength. For Zenith and his people, the Lord strengthens them. They are successful in driving the Lamanites out of their land. And the Lamanites, their result was they were driven from the land with a great slaughter. There is value in pointing out that we do everything that we can do, particularly as we do in the battle of our every day against Satan and his followers and the influences of Satan. But we also need to remember that in the battle against evil, we need to put our trust in God. He can deliver us from all the ills of our day. And have you thought about how the scriptures describe Zenith? Zenith is an example of somebody who's not just zealous, but overzealous. He takes something good and goes so much more on it. Disciples who are steadfast and immovable do not become fanatics or extremists, are not overzealous, and are not preoccupied with misguided gospel hobbies. President Joseph F. Smith emphasized we frequently look around us and see people who incline to extremes, who are fanatical, who may be sure that this is a class of people do not understand the gospel. They have forgotten, if they ever knew, that it is very unwise to take a fragment of truth and treat it as if it were the whole thing. Being zealous can be a good thing. Overzealous is not. And for me, people who are overzealous are like those who play the piano but only know one or two notes. Maybe they can do the theme song of Jaws. Maybe they can make one note sound beautiful, but somebody who's overzealous only hits a few notes and never understands the beauty of a movement played with virtually all the keys on the keyboard. They never understand how a piano can sound as a part of a full symphony of the gospel. Don't be overzealous, but be anxiously engaged not over anxious. Just some ideas that uh, I've talked about in teaching today. Uh, first, uh, BYU's virtual scriptures. Uh, you can give overview of those significant journeys with um, the curriculum's map, which is very simple but really fun. You can look for, again, those if-then pro promises. We do have prophets, seers, and revelators. It's great to identify what a prophet is, what a seer is, and what a revelator is. Thank you for spending a little bit of time with me today in Brother Miller's notes. All of my quotes are on Brother Mil or brotherrmiller.wordpress.com. And just so you know, some of the quotes that I have are much more lengthy at the, my WordPress site. And I'm going to put the whole, whole quote up. And I'll put a part of it in this presentation for time's sake. Have a great day.